Then um, everyone else get comfortable and welcome. Thanks for staying upstairs. All right. We are looking this morning um, at the book of Samuel. We're continuing uh, the story of David and of just good stuff from his life of following after God's heart. What a what a challenge we've been having. We're in the book. We're already at chapter 17. Um, I thought we were going to just be dropping in, but we've been able to go chapter by chapter, which has been fun for me. It's also been a challenge for me because um, I'm really familiar with specific pieces of David's life. And then there's a lot of stuff in there that I kind of had probably blown through before. But we're, we're getting to a really good passage today that's really common, really famous, really popular. I'm glad that we're doing it when kids are upstairs because it might be a really familiar one. Um, but before I do, I just I need to make an admission. I need to admit something this morning. It's been kind of weird. I noticed it this weekend um, as we were out playing and doing a bunch of snow activities with the high schoolers, which I love doing. I love those retreats. Um, but as I've gotten older, <laughs> those retreats, I've noticed stuff that's my, my attitude towards stuff has changed a little bit. I'll just be honest. I've become a a lot more fearful. <laughs> Stuff that was really fun before, I used to love this broom ball game, which is essentially a clumsier hockey. You don't have to wear skates, and you get a stick with a big rubber thing on the end of it um, to play you know, a hockey-type game. And I used to love this game, and now all I can do when I'm watching it is be worrying that these kids, you know, and it was fun to watch everybody fall, right? Falling is like the best part of it, and you're off. And yet, now I just picture those swinging sticks and people's faces and bones that would break on me if I fell, like, and the different things. And it's just like, it's so much less fun for me when I, it, the kids are still having a great time. They're doing great and nobody, they fell a ton and they get right back up. But, um, but I was thinking about it and a lot of things, again, we, there's a ton to be fearful of. And I've thought about this lately. Um, so today, the, t the message today is really, what do those with a heart after God do in the face of fear? They're, I mean, I, you can think, I'm, not, I'm a tough person, I'm okay, I'm not really fearful. But the fear has, you know, a lot of dis um, kind of secret words too, you know, worry, anxiety, you know, what do you get anxious about? And so there's a ton of bad stuff out there. We could start listing it and get everybody really stressed out of the of the news and of wars and of, you know, uh, whatever else is going on. But you, you know it's, you know, even culture-wise, culture might be feeling like it's, it's suffocating us and, and looming really large. Um, things that are threatening to our comfort, threatening to our well-being, um, health things, right? I don't, again, I don't want to give you the list of all these things to be fearful of, but you've got them in the back of your minds. I think we just want to recognize that we are. Um, and just know that there's plenty to be afraid of. Um, and yet, we're told in Scripture, do not fear. So much in the Bible talks about, um, in God's plan, God says, don't be afraid. I've got plans for you. I want you to live a life of faith. And a life of faith is not really a life of fear. Now, that's hard. So what do we do about that? There's fearful stuff. There's scary stuff out there. And yet... We're supposed to not live with complete blind to it, but we're supposed to live and work and, and worship the Lord in a, in a faithful way, not a fearful way. Okay? So today's message is living, fighting fear with a heart of faith. And today's a great popular story, again, is uh, David and Goliath. It's 1 Samuel 17. So if you've got a Bible, it would be great to, to, to open up there. Um, and for the kids who are here, don't check out. This might be one that you know already. And for the adults who are here, who have taught this maybe, who have heard this, don't check out either. You might have, um, I know David and Goliath. That's that one. You know, it's easy. Here's, um, here's the kid. Here's the, the thing, the giant. Okay, there, this is a story that I love. It's got drama. It's got details. It, it kind of wakes up our curiosity, right? Um, but we might think that we know it already. You might be like, okay, I've got this one. I can snooze for the next 20 minutes, half hour, right? But look, everything in the Bible, I, I, was, I was studying it. I was thinking of how to teach it. 
I was finding new stuff in here. So we don't want to fall into the trap of thinking we know it already. Okay? There's always things we can learn from the Bible and always different things that might be hitting us in our lives at different times. So um, if you're familiar with it, we want to ask, really, what is this story really about? Okay, what is David and Goliath really about? We've, it's become so ubiquitous, right? Even if you see something with big odds, it's like, oh, it's the classic David versus Goliath story, right? So sometimes we think the story is about overcoming odds, right? Like you can do big things or be braver than usual. But here's the thing. This is really about facing fears with faith, okay? Eyes of faith is what is the focus of this book, this passage, um, and it's fantastic. So we're going to read the whole story. Sometimes we skip parts of it, but I'm going to read the whole thing of what it's about, and it's amazing to see these different things. Now, again, the whole piece of what we've been studying David is about because David is presented to us, given to us as a person who is a person of faith. His heart is after God's. So there's things, when he demonstrates faith, when he demonstrates that he's going after God, we want to copy him. We want to take those as lessons. Um, and so the book has really taken us, and it's dropped us. We finally just were introduced to him last week, um, that he was anointed by Samuel to be the future king. And so Saul, the person who doesn't really have a heart after God, the story is shifting away from him, and it's shifting to David. So really, the first thing, if we're going to be looking at this story and thinking, what is it really about, or what do you think it's about, I'm going to start with saying this really isn't, and if you look at your Bible, most of them have it say David and Goliath, or David versus Goliath. I'll be honest, I think the start of this book, and the start of this chapter, is not really David versus Goliath, but it's David versus Saul. You might have heard this before already, but... David and Goliath is not really the biggest fight here, the biggest contrast. The bigger contrast is David, who has a heart of faith, and Saul, who doesn't. So David and Saul is really what it should be. But there's other chapters. That's why they didn't title it that way. So we're going to get into it. The story that starts with danger. So in case you're wondering about fear and faith um, and wondering if there's things to be fearful of. There is stuff to be fearful of, and this starts that way, the first 10 verses of 1 Samuel. So let's start reading it uh, together and see if you can't spot some of the pieces that talk about fearfulness. Okay, it says, The Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. 17 verse 1, They pitched camp at Ephes Damin between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. That's about nine foot nine inches tall. He had a bronze helmet in his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs were bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Already we get a lot of description, right? Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And that's where I'll pause. Okay, so the first piece of this story that we kind of have to recognize and notice if you're going to be fighting fear with eyes of faith is that there is something to be afraid of. There is danger here, okay? And it is a serious threat, right, introduced by Goliath. Um, we're not normally, you know, this is somewhat new to us. We're not always, uh, as we think about life, we're not 
lining up to fight battles physically, right, against enemies at our door. But war is what the Israelites are facing. Philistines were lined up on one side, Israelites on another, and there's a champion laying out a challenge. Okay? So this description of Goliath is meant to convey that he is a threat, a scary, scary dude. Okay? So um, if you've ever watched combat sport or any boxing fans out here, any wrestling or... Uh, not WWE wrestling, but like the actual wrestling and, and fighting guys. Um, there's this thing they do that's called the tail of the tape, and they'll line up the two competitors, right? And they'll say, this guy is 28 years old, this guy is 36 years old, this guy is 6 foot 4, this guy is 5'11. And you're like, well, wait a second, 5'11, 6 foot 4. Oh, but this guy who's 5'11 is 300 pounds, and this guy who's 6 foot 4 is 280 pounds. So, okay, they're more evenly, right? Matched up. Well, that's kind of the tale of the tape of Goliath that we get, right? So we get some of his stats, right? If you're looking at it, six cubits in a span, nine foot, nine inches tall. That's pretty big. <laughs> uh, a coat of scale armor made of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. So, of course, you have to look up what's 5,000 shekels. Um, that's about 125 pounds for his coat of armor. Okay, can you imagine carrying... Seems to me like that's not exactly like the best, right? Like the best way to go. But if you picture one of our favorite movies is A Knight's Tale. You know, those picture of those knights, they had those big things. And it wasn't so much about how fast you could move, but it was like you're essentially indestructible, right? If you uh, are more common thing. And bronze armor, you think, oh, okay, bronze armor. Well, in 1000 BC, we're in the Bronze Age. So bronze armor was pretty cutting edge tech. We're talking. Think about if you're the kids watching Iron Man movies, right? That's what he's wearing. He's got the full tech gear. Like, this is protecting him. He's not going to be um, easily taken out, right? Um, also, these shin guards, a bronze javelin on his back. The tip of his spear weighs, what does it say, 600 shekels. That's 15 pounds. So 15 pounds for the tip of the spear. That's a, that's a solid piece of of equipment. Okay, so basically he's just unusually large, strong, and a serious challenge is put out by him. What's the challenge? One against one. This is actually a pretty nice thing. Israel and Philistines had fought and had these skirmishes for a while. And so they were constantly used to fighting each other battles, soldiers on one side, soldiers on another. And so this champion against champion uh, challenge was given out, basically he was saying, look, we want to save some time, save some energy, save some lives, actually. And so instead of all of us just going into a huge melee and whoever's last people standing, you know, the 10 people that's left, they're the winners and everybody else is injured or dying, we're going to save ourselves some time and one against one. We can decide this based on, like, a more humane way of, of warring with each other, right? And so this is actually what the people of Israel had asked for. If we remember back to the beginning of, the, when, of, of Saul's story, when the people had asked for a king, this is what they wanted. They wanted to have a king. This is in um, chapter 8. They specifically asked, they said, look, we want a king so that, like the other nations, we can have this person lead us, and they'll go out and fight our battles for us. We want a big guy who can do this. And that's what Saul was. Saul was, remember, a head and shoulders above all the people around him. So we talk about how Goliath is huge and, you know, David's this little guy. But Saul was no slouch either. Slouch, uh, Saul was probably about 6'6", six, 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 if he's a head and a foot, you know, head and shoulders above everybody around him. Averages back then, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, so Saul doing pretty good himself. So his job really is to go out as the champion. And yet, this challenge of Goliath is met with a less than enthusiastic response. And then, so that really is what the next section's about, the different responses to this threat. Okay, Saul and the Israelites are, are ready to go. A threat is put in front of them. Goliath is out here. What are they gonna respond with? 
And that's really what we see for the next few verses. So I want to read those and just notice how people respond to a fearful situation. Okay, verse 11 starts with the people. It says, On hearing the Philistines' word, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Okay? It's a, it's a, I guess it's an accurate description, and it's a pretty normal thing, but to be scared. They were <laughs> responding to a scary situation with fear. But then we get the contrast, and we get a new explanation. So verse 12 says this. The people were terrified. Now David was at home. And so it just shifts, completely shifts scene and says, David, we're going to reintroduce him. He's the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse. This is in verse 12, who is from Bethlehem in Judah. Judah had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So David really is just minding his own business. For 40 days, the Philistines came, out, came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. 40 days. Goliath, you've probably heard this. Goliath makes this challenge. This battle has got some buildup to it. There's nothing happening for 40 days except for Goliath putting out this challenge. Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to the camp. Take along these ten cheese to the commander and their unit. See how the brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They're with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So Jesse doesn't really know what's going on yet. He doesn't know about the challenge that's being there. This is just a well-being check on his sons. Verse 20, Early in the morning David let, left the flock in care loaded up and set out as he was directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out into its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. Now here's where it gets interesting. As he was talking to them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the men, they all fled from him in great fear. Okay, so here's the second time we're getting to hear what happens to most of the Israelites when they hear about Goliath, right? When he first gives the call, they are dismayed and fearful. Now we get to hear him again when, others, when they saw that man, they fled in great fear. Now the Israelites kept saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. And he'll also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing him next to him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what had been said and said, this is what will be done to the man who kills him. So what's interesting here. <clears throat> I see multiple responses, right, to the threat. The normal, faithless response is by the Israelite people, right? And what is their response? Dismay and fear. They see that giant, they see he's big, they see he's strong, and they are not the first ones to volunteer. This is a great thing of just group thinking, right? Like, that one big guy, if he stands up, He's asking for one of us, and everybody's saying, hey, who's going to volunteer? And looking around, it's like, nope, I'm good. I'm happy with where I'm at, right? And yet, I find interesting here, the second response is Saul's. We don't see it right as directly, right? The people are looking around. The, the soldiers are standing there like, no, we're not going to be part of this. But Saul gives a response in here. Do you see what his, uh, Saul's response is? kind of have to look a little deeper because, as was said, Saul is their king. He's supposed to lead them in battle. 
So he should be the number one guy. Like, all right, guys, I got this. This is my job. This is what I get paid the big bucks for, right? I'm going to go forward and fight the champion, champion against champion, tall guy against tall guy. And yet Saul didn't volunteer first. And what does he do instead based on these verses? I'll even have the little guys, the, the young ones here who are paying attention. He puts out the bounty, right? He, he, he tries to give like a motivator to everybody else. He says, okay, instead of volunteering, here's what I'll do. I'll be such a, I'm a brave leader. Here's what I will do. I'll pay whoever will, will step up. I'll actually pay a lot to whoever steps up to make sure I don't have to do it. What is it, right? Verses 20, what is it, 20, uh, 25. King will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He'll give his daughter in marriage and will exempt that family from taxes. I mean, the king who's supposed to be doing it is like, here, I've got everything besides myself to offer to this thing. And so, really, it's a dereliction of his duties. He'll give a great reward, but he's not going to step up himself. So that's the first contrast of Saul's response. Saul clearly in fear, isn't going to step up. But then on top of that, he's going to try and get anybody else to do it. And then what is David's response? David's response is the one I want to focus the most on. David's response is offense. He's literally offended at what Goliath is doing. His response is the one of faith to say, hold on a second. What's going on here? Why are we all just sitting back here while this person is defying God? Now, here's the thing. Um, he's offended. Any of us get offended easily? Well, how about not easily, but anybody here get offended by what's going on around you? Here's the thing. Being offended is really easy. It's really easy to be offended. Um, we see it. Um, I'll just, I won't ask for yours, but I'll just say some that I can get offended with. Okay? So first of all, um, we're emotional creatures. That's a normal thing that God gave us. He gives us our feelings, our, and they do serve a purpose. To, to be offended is, is something that happens. Um, but I get offended by foolish things, I'll just be honest. Where you get offended, here's some stuff I get offended by. Um, I get offended when I give a good idea, like a really good idea, that everyone should just be like, thank you so much for that great idea, Pastor Chris. And people don't like say, thank you so much for that idea, and they just decide to do a different idea. I get offended by that. Why? I don't know. I liked my idea, right? Um, I get offended that my rights are infringed on, right? Like my, even just little things that I'm like, you know what? I want to do things this way, and yet here comes whatever it is, and my rights are, are kind of feeling like they're I'm getting a little bit too, too controlled by others. I get offended by that, right? Um, I get offended, let me think, by feeling disrespected, Right? And even the, here's the thing about it, being, feeling disrespected is my own interpretation. You know, something happens and I'm just like, well, you, I said hello and you just kind of gave me a, huh, what, what kind of respect was that? Should I be, right? And then here I can be offended by something just like that when someone doesn't, didn't hear me, right? So it's really easy to get offended. Um, and here's the reason why most offenses are not worth taking offense at at all. Most of those is because it's my pride, my um, respect that's being dismissed, right? I feel like I should be respected. I feel like everybody should worship me. So when they're not doing so, I'm offended. And yet, here's the thing. David's offended by this disrespect. David is offended by this disrespect, but he is correctly offended because it's not his name Right, that's being disrespected, that he's trying to defend. He's defending, he's rightly offended because God's name is being disrespected. Um, his response there, right? He says, what's going to be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? This guy is disgraceful to Israel, to God's people. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who's defying the armies of the living God? Now, it's not just my, his team that he's like, hey, that's our team. We shouldn't be. He, he knows and recognizes that God 
is the one behind Israel, right? Goliath is disrespecting God. God's people, Israel, okay? Now, this isn't our normal thing, like nationalistic, patriotic thing of like, hey, our people are being disrespected. David's recognizing, look, Israel is only special in the Old Testament and today because God chose to make it so. Because God said, this is going to be my people, okay? So defying Israel in, in this time, in this day, was defying God. And he says, look, that can't be. This isn't just about me or our people or, or Israel. This is about God's name. And so his response is, who does he think he's talking to, right? Goliath mocking God's people is defying and disrespecting God. And, and that can't happen. He says, that's not right. Um, so God's followers, right? That's his first response that, that we see that's really good. His followers should care for his reputation. Okay? We should care that God's name is not dragged through the mud. That's something we can apply immediately for ourselves. David's saying, hey, that's not, this is not okay. This is something we can take from David as an example and say, hold on, there, you're right. We should care that God's name is not ex uh, dragged through the mud. Um, it's something we talk about in our house because it's one of those things, and we'll talk about it with kids and kids who might be going to school and things, right? We talk about this sometimes about bad words, right, in our house. And we sometimes talk, like, and the question of curious kids is, okay, I hear people say something, right? Why, you know, we, we'll have the conversation, why don't we say, oh my God, in our house, right? Why is that a thing? And, and we hear it in, in why, why would that be something that we shouldn't say? Like, well, or a TV show, and it's like, mm, you know what, that's not a, you know, and it's, so, it's said in such a slight way, right? It's such a small thing a lot of times, and it's very common in school, and OMG instead, and it's like, well, okay, OMG, OMG, right? We can change it to gosh or something. But, but we've asked ourselves that, that exact question, like, why is that something that's not, we shouldn't do? Well, here's why. God's name is something that deserves respect, right? God's name is great. He is great. So even something that's small like that, it's just kind of a throwaway thing. It's just an exclamation. It doesn't mean anything, right? But it's still a way that kind of doesn't respect God's name. And, and as we look in, the, in um, God's name is something we want to respect because it represents him, right? So um, one of the Psalms that we pulled up as well, it says here, Oh, man, and I don't have the reference, but I'll find it. It says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever. We want to raise that name up, right? That name of Jesus, of God, is one to be lifted up. And why? Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom, right? One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. So the reason we, we respect God's name is because we respect God. And why do we respect God? Because he is great. Okay, his name is just part of that. So we don't use his name lightly. And respecting his name, if we call ourselves a Christian, we are carrying that name. So not just in the word of saying, hey, don't say that word. Don't take it lightly that way. But if you're carrying his name as Christian, as a follower of God, that's even more so. We better not be dragging his name through the mud in our actions, right? If we're saying, hey, I'm a Christian, and then acting ungodly, right, unchristlike, our lives should demonstrate that reverence that God, for God that David shows. So he is great. His name deserves respect. And that's what David does. So his response is next. David's response of bold faith in the face of fear. And we get to see where that faith comes from. Because I've, I've got to say, I want to have that faith that is bold. And yet, I don't know what, how to do that sometimes. Okay. So here's what David does. He, we jump ahead uh, to verse 34. This, the, 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 uh, the threat is there. David's response of offense is there. He sees that God's name needs to be, should be defended. So in verse 34, David steps up to the plate and he says, okay, hold on. What do we have to do? So David says to Paul, Saul, 
Okay, we'll start. Sorry about that. We'll pick up right there and go to 32. David says to Saul, look, let no one lose heart on account of the Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. David says, I'll take care of this. Let me do it. Saul replied, you're not able to go against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But here's where we get to see where David's faith and his courage comes from. He says, David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from his mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by his hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Where does David's faith, bold faith, come from? Right? That's what I want to see. I'm like, man, he just steps up. Is it just youthful arrogance? Like he's young, he doesn't know better, so he's like, I'm going to go after it. I can do this. David, in his youth, shows a real strength of faith in his response here. He's not just giving his resume, look, I can handle it because I fought a lion and a bear before. Right? No. He responds in faith because he knows what God has done for him. He knows what God's done for me. He's said, look, I've been in scraps before, but it's not me who did it, right? I, I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. I can, I can fight a guy. But it's not just like I can do it because I've got these skills. What does he say? His faith, he says, look, the end of it. God, verse 37. Look, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. He saw that that resume of killing a lion, killing a bear, he recognized that wasn't just me. Yeah, God gave me skill. I, I've, I've got some, some eye-hand coordination. I've got, you know, know how to do things. But he's like, no, that wasn't me. God did that. God rescued me from those two things, and God will rescue me from that Philistine. Okay? He looks at his life and sees his experiences with eyes of faith. How important is it for us, right, for us who's facing fearful things to look back at our lives and say, God got me through that. God took care of me in this thing. He's the one, you know, you could, I'm telling you, you could say, ah, you know what? Well, actually, let's look at that for a second. He has these skills because God rescued him. And so he doesn't need Saul's armor on any of these other things. God's his protector. He saw that God had protected him. And here's where that flip side of Saul versus David comes in. It says, look, because <clears throat> after he says that, you'd be like, wow, what a good message, right? I love, I, I, I noticed that for the first time this time, because he says, look, I'm going to take care of it. And Saul says to David, okay, go and the Lord be with you. He almost be, it almost looks like Saul's going to be like, wow, great faith. Yes, God's going to take care of you. He says, go and may the Lord take care of you. But then, what does the next verse talk about? We, it's a familiar scene in the, in the story, right? Then Saul dressed David in his own stuff. He put in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. And I think this is David going along with it. But David fastened his sword over his tunic and tried walking around because he wasn't used to him. And of course, David says, I can't go in these. I'm not used to them. He took it off. Instead, he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones, and put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag, and sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. That's not just an interesting kind of aside. When we talk in this story, it's really great to see with David showing and demonstrating faith and saying, look, I have take, God took care of me. I can take care of this next situation. This is the contrast. This is Saul's showing his faithlessness. Saul doesn't get it because he says, wow, good job. God protected you. You're going to trust God in this. That's very good of you. Now, let me give you the help that you'll need on top of God's help. <laughs> Do you see it? Saul could have been saying, look, 
it, this really reminds us that Saul should be the one who's fighting. Right? Saul should be the one with faith who says, you know what, I'm going to take care of God's people. And yet, he doesn't. He's, he's just derelict with his duties. Saul could have demonstrated that same perspective David did. If we remember from 1 Samuel 11 through 14, Saul actually did do some of these things. God worked in Saul to have given him some victories over the Philistines. Right? Um, they had done that. He had rescued him. Uh, verse 14, in chapter 14, is a good example there. Yet Saul doesn't have that same heart. Right? Saul's heart for God's name to be respected is not there. And Saul doesn't give credit to the victories that he's been given. Saul, in fact, takes the credit for the victories that he was given. And so that's the difference between them. David, when he sees what God has done and brought him through, says, yes, God did that. Saul says, I don't know, maybe try this stuff out. Maybe you can, you know, maybe here, use this, uh, this iron thing. It just shows that he is not have the right attitude. And so you've got to see God's hand in the experience. Saul doesn't. And so, again, who's rescued you? Who's brought you through to this point? That's something we should be experiencing and something we should be using as an exercise. When we look at our life, when we look at the challenge, when we look at something fearful ahead of us, we're pretty quick to drop our faith in God and be like, I don't know, I'm just stuck. I don't know how we're going to get through this thing. And yet, David's example is say, look, God brought me through other things. I can put my trust in him for the next one. Okay? And then the next piece, David acts in faith with Saul. Then he acts in faith with Goliath, knowing who that confidence is in. And so here's the thing. This long-awaited showdown, right? We've had 40 days plus that we've been waiting for this showdown. This is why I don't think this is all about David versus Goliath, because after all this time, what do we get? One little verse that says, right? Here he comes. It's super quick. And he says, look, I'm going to go, and I'm going to fight him. The Philistine kept coming closer to David. He looked David over. This is uh, verse 42. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Kind of just, this is just typical trash talk. I don't know if anybody knows sports and basketball and things, but in this day, this is, the, this is what you do. You, you kind of make your, puff yourself up a little bit. I'm going to feed you to the birds. All right, I'm going to take you out. Well, here's the thing that's a little unique about David's trash talk. Because, right, David, Goliath says, I'm going to take you out. And I'm cursing you with his gods, right? But David says to the Philistine, look, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. Okay, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel who you defied. This day the Lord will deliver you in my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. The battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Uh, we'll, we'll save the last piece, right? But here's that talk. The, the two talks right there, incredible that, that this is, again, like the trash talk, the buildup. But what is it about it? What does David say that's just unique? He says, look. My confidence is not. You've got a sword, a spear, and a javelin, right? You've got the high-tech suit that is impenetrable. It weighs, what, 125 pounds, 15 pounds? It's kind of funny. David knows the comparative power. And if we're looking at it, you say, wow, the comparative power, right? David, little, underdog, Goliath, big, over, right? Those things are supposed to intimidate. They're the biggest scary stuff. And David says... Is that all you've got? <laughs> Seriously, is that it? You've got nothing. You're coming with this. That, that whole list of stuff that made sure we knew that was a big threat. David says, you've got nothing. 
you don't hold a candle to me. Not because of me. I don't, I don't have anything special. But look, the power that I'm fighting with. He says it a few times, right? He's, this, this confidence is really crazy to me. I, I, I'm envious of it. Not because he's got that much confidence, but because, look, he knows the one who can deliver him. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you defied. Okay, the ultimate weapon, guys. It's not swords. It's not the spirit. It's not the sling. You, you, people can make the argument and be like, oh, but look, he was more agile, and so that's why his, his thing worked better than the, the big, bulky guy, right? No, David knows what he has. He's got God, Yahweh. That's where his power lies. Okay, God's power, again, is greater than any earthly power. Anything that we might be afraid of, okay, it's bigger, it's stronger. It works things out for the good of those who love him. And so for us, for us, take courage. Take courage in that. You know, I know it's difficult. And some of the things we look at look like giants, right? They look unpenetrable, un, you know, things we can't even wrap our minds around getting through or getting past and a, a good ending for us. There are scary things at us. And yet, look, the right perspective for us, the right perspective, recognize that those giants are nothing to be compared with God's power. Okay? If he's brought you through something, again, he will take care of you in the battle you're facing. So again, that thing that you, that's one of the things we need to look back. Look back and give him the credit that he has given us. He will do it, and here's why he does it. He does it for his name's sake. Right? That whole thing of, of offense at God's name being taken, dragged through the mud. God cares about his name. And he, he does good things for his people, not just for them, not just to be you know, he is generous. He is kind. But it's not just for our good. We don't, it's not just so we can be happy with our lives. He does it for his name's sake. Because then when people worship him, when people give him credit, that's what he deserves. That's what's right. Okay? So again, the, the word for us, let's trust him to walk boldly, boldly into the challenges that face us. Give him the credit and the praise he deserves especially, again, when he takes care of us, that he does so often. So we're going to pray, and we're going to share in communion and recognize even the greatest thing that he's done for us in, in um, his death and resurrection. So we're going to move there, but let's pray just as we move from one to the next. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story. We thank you for David and Goliath, really David and Saul, how you show yourself to be God, just a God that can be trusted. Um, Lord, we thank you that in the lives of David, your power is still available to us. You are still the great God who is ruling, who is all-powerful and all-loving, Lord. And so we thank you for the work that you've done, and I pray that we would be people who, who trust you in it. As we face fears, Lord, I pray that we would trust you with it. And, um, with eyes of faith, Lord. Thank you for this example for us. In your name we pray. Amen.